Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of human has been discovered in China, evidence of two different human species crossing paths one and a half million years ago have been discovered, killer whales have been recorded hunting the biggest fish alive, and much more. If you want to pre-order your very own swimbo for a loved one this Christmas, or yourself, or for an unloved one, oh, or maybe for all three, then check out the link below to help bring an array of swimbos to present planet Earth. Our top story this week is the announcement that a new species of prehistoric human has been named, based on fossils found in China and other places in East Asia. The name of this new human is Homo juluensis, and it's been said to have had existed from just under 300,000 years ago until potentially 50,000 years ago. A fossilised skull dated to between 200 and 160,000 years ago has been chosen as the type specimen. So this is the one that defines the species, and is the one all other specimens must be compared to. This skull was originally discovered in the 1970s. Interestingly, the researchers who who have named Homo juluensis have also said that the Denisovans should be included within this species. The enigmatic humans that interbred with the ancient Homo sapiens and were close relatives of the Neanderthals. By naming Homo juluensis, the scientists aim to clear up the mess and confusion surrounding the classification of fossil human remains from East Asia at these times in Earth's history. They highlight how this part of the world was home to several very different kinds of humans, including the island dwarf populations of Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis. Plus, there was a Homo longi in China, and now also Homo juluensis. And they expect that more species will be named in future, especially as there are a few more skulls from other places which they still aren't sure about what they might be. We should say, though, that we're personally a little confused by the way this apparent new species has been named, as it currently looks like there's only a commentary article in the journal Nature Communications, with no actual paper defining the species as of yet. But it looks like it might be in press. And then there's also a book by the same authors where they named the new species. It just seems a little bit weird at the moment, and some other paleontologists seem cautious about it too. But let's see how it develops. There's more very exciting prehistoric human news next, as a fossil trackway in Kenya has been discovered that preserves footprints made by two different human species that cross paths with each other one and a half million years ago. At this time in Africa, there would have been at least a few different hominins coexisting. One of these was Homo erectus, but there were also members of the Australopithecine lineage, including the so-called robust Australopithecine Paranthropus boisei. This species is notable for the very pronounced crest on the top of its head that anchored immense jaw muscles. Well, in this new study, researchers report their finding of ancient trackways made next to a lake in Kenya, which show two trackways clearly created by hominins with very different styles of walking. Both Homo erectus and Paranthropus were upright bipedal walkers, but the difference in track shapes show that the gait of Homo erectus falls within the range of other recorded human gaits, while Paranthropus was slightly outside the human range. Excitingly, the presence of these two trackways on the same surface indicates that the prints were made within days or perhaps even hours of each other showing that these two very different members of the human lineage would have had interactions with one another. The researchers also re-examined several other trackway sites in Kenya, and noticed these distinct walking styles among those prints too, showing their coexistence was widespread. It's a tantalising thought. What did these two species make of one another? Were there ever any aggressive interactions between them? Did they just chill with each other? These footprints really are a remarkable discovery, highlighting how fascinating the world must have been at this time, when multiple kinds of almost human species coexisted. There's some great dinosaur news next, as paleontologists have been getting excited over fossilised dinosaur poop. Of course they have. The scientists have examined hundreds of fossils that preserve the direct evidence of feeding found at sites in Poland, 
which date to the Triassic and early Jurassic periods. These fossils include bones with bite marks on them, as well as various kinds of animal excrement, such as regurgitated food, intestinal contents, and prehistoric poop. Just what we want. Tracking the changes in what dinosaurs and other animals were eating across these time periods, the paleontologists observed several stages showing how dinosaurs rose to dominate those ecosystems. First, opportunistic dinosaur precursors replaced non-dinosaurs that occupied omnivorous niches. Then insect and fish-eating theropod dinosaurs appeared, along with small omnivorous true dinosaurs. Next, climate changes at the end of the Triassic meant vegetation types changed, and herbivorous dinosaurs diversified. Finally, the meat-eating theropods then rapidly diversified too, and evolved much larger sizes, in response to the appearance of larger herbivores. Although this is just data from Poland, it might be representative of the dinosaurs' rise to dominance across the planet. So it's a fascinating new study showing just how useful fossilised poop can be. And everyday poop, you know, you can tell everything from poop. Y you remember when, when Stephen in Premier went <laughs> Not a meat eater, he eats fish. Also in the news this week, a study by the University of Wyoming has identified the species in which 32 bone needles at an Ice Age archaeological site came from and suggests they were used to create clothes to let them traverse to colder regions. These needles have been discovered at the Lapreal Mammoth Site, an archaeological site situated on an ancient mammoth kill that became a campsite for a population of early Lithics people, the first human inhabitants of North America. Bone needles found at the 12,900-year-old site on the North Platte River in Wyoming were found to be produced from the bones of foxes, hares and felids such as bobcats, mountain lions, lynx, and possibly the now extinct American cheetah. Tens of thousands of artifacts associated with single occupation have been found at the site, amongst these being the 32 bone needle fragments. This study is significant in a number of ways. It is the first to identify the species from which the early lithic people produced eyed bone needles and provide strong evidence for tailored garment production using bone needles and fur-bearing animal pelts, which would have been integral in enabling the dispersal of early human populations to otherwise uninhabitable northern latitudes. A great study to start off our archaeology this week and shows the resourcefulness of these people as they used all parts of the animal to their advantage. Next in the archaeological news, Neanderthal groups that inhabited a cave in Spain 46,000 years ago were the first human species that gathered and collected fossils. Several European sites have shown that Neanderthal groups had treasured objects that attracted their attention, and these objects were probably altered to make personal ornaments. But currently, no site has yielded more than a couple of these artefacts, but the Prado Vargas cave in Cornejo, Spain, has yielded 15 artefacts in the Mousterian level of the cave, which dates to between 60 to 40,000 years ago. Here, archaeologists found an assemblage of 15 marine fossils dating back much earlier, to the Upper Cretaceous period more than 66 million years ago. All specimens or mollusks, either being clams or snail shells, except for one which was a sea urchin fossil. All but one show no signs of having been used as tools, possibly indicating that these were part of a collection. The authors of the study state that it is clear the selection and transportation of these fossils meant something to the people that collected them, perhaps indicating a kind of symbolism in their group. They may have been collected for aesthetic purposes or exchange or to reinforce cultural identity. It's also possible that they were collected by children, further humanising our closest extinct relatives. And finally, for the archaeology news this week, the reanalysis of an archaeological site in Belize reveals that early Mesoamericans trapped fish for over a thousand years earlier than originally thought. The research team from the University of New Hampshire took 26 carbon date samples from an archaeological site in the Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary, which is the largest inland wetland in Belize. The site consists of a network of channels designed to direct annual floodwaters into source ponds in order to trap fish. Originally believed to have been created by the Maya population, whose ancient cities were located nearby, 
This study has revealed that they were instead produced by a much earlier group of people. These large-scale fisheries have been dated to the late Archaic period, between 4,000 and 3,900 years ago, which predates any earlier examples of large-scale fishing in the Amazon region by over a thousand years. This fish trapping facility was extremely complex and intricate in its design. Estimates indicate it would have yielded enough fish to feed as many as 15,000 people throughout the year. It is thought that this area would have encouraged social gatherings year after year, eventually giving rise to the pre-Columbian Maya civilization seen in the area over a thousand years later. So an incredible study with some very important connotations that further portray how ancient hunter-gatherers were far more resourceful and adaptable than we normally give them credit for. Next up in the news is something much, much older than humans and even dinosaurs. Primordial black holes have been theorised but never observed. The idea is that the extreme conditions in the very early universe may have created a great number of really small black holes, forming well before before even the first stars began to emerge. It has even been suggested that these primordial black holes could be dark matter, the mysterious type of matter that is often thought to make up most of the matter in the universe. But, like I said, a primordial black hole has never been observed, so we don't know if they exist. A study published this week has suggested some places where we could start looking for them, suggesting evidence of their existence could range from the size of a minor planet to microscopic. The study suggested that planets could form around these small black holes, consume their insides and then leave a hollow shell behind. It is actually possible to estimate the mass of an exoplanet by analysing its orbital characteristics. So a hollow planet like the one suggested here would actually be detectable. The paper also suggests we could look for evidence of primordial black holes here on Earth. Really, really small black holes that still have enough mass and speed to carve a tiny straight tunnel through solid objects. The study suggests rocks that are billions of years old as a good place to look. Certainly a very interesting paper, which could potentially end up having a great deal of significance later on down the line if such evidence is found. In other news, we're sticking with the matter of, well, matter. At the moment, CERN, the organisation that runs the Large Hadron Collider, is the only place able to create antimatter in such a state where it could be caught and stored without annihilating itself, which is what happens if it gets into contact with any matter. Well, facilities all over the world would love to be able to study antimatter in more detail themselves. So two teams of scientists at CERN are trying to set up the transportation of antimatter for the first time ever. If this can be achieved, it will open up a host of new opportunities to study antimatter. To begin with, these antimatter particles won't travel particularly far, but one team plans to send antiprotons to a site 700 kilometers away in a later trip. The ability to transport antimatter will mark an important step in how we can study and use different types of matter. What that will lead to, we don't know. This week, there have also been a couple of interesting news stories about orcas. The first one reports an observations of orcas in the Gulf of California hunting whale sharks. Whale sharks are the largest fish to inhabit our oceans, reaching up to 18 metres in length. Although the whale sharks the orcas targeted are thought to be juveniles, and so they're a bit smaller than this. From 2018 to 2024, four events were observed. The orcas worked cooperatively in a coordinated attack, repeatedly hitting the whale shark on the underside of the head at high speed to stun and immobilize it. They then manipulated the shark to position it upside down, which put it in a state of tonic immobility, where it was unable to move to escape. Poor thing. The orcas were then able to bite into the underside of the shark where there is less muscle and cartilage, thus allowing easier access to the internal organs which they then consume. The other story is a little bit more wholesome. It seems that the salmon hat trend is back as orcas off the coast of Washington have been seen wearing dead salmon on their heads. This was a trend observed among orcas 37 years ago that lasted about a year 
but then it seemed to stop. However, like many trends, it has had a resurgence. It is hoped the drone footage, which wouldn't have been available 37 years ago, will help researchers piece together the reason why orcas are again wearing salmon. Obviously, salmon is this season's colour, guys. Do you not keep up with Vogue? If you would like to learn more about orcas eating sharks, then go to Ben's mum's channel, One World, where there is an interesting video about orcas eating great white sharks. Next up, Ben's dad is here to talk about a new citizen science project that he's tried and that you can take part in at home. Hi Ben's dad. And which citizen science project have you chosen to review for us this time? This time I've chosen one called Walrus from Space, uh, where you can help polar biologists to check satellite images to see if you can spot uh, walruses in any of them. What? You mean you can see walruses from space? Yep, that's true. Um, the resolution of the satellite imagery is now um, quite high uh, and it's so good that you can see groups of walrus. Uh, sometimes you can see individual ones and sometimes you can see them in the water as well. So what would 7DOS viewers need to do to take part? OK, so the project is run by the Worldwide Fund for Nature um, in collaboration with the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and so I've included a couple of links with some more information and how to register for the project in the description. Uh, it's really very simple. You register, you log in, and then you get started on a few uh, training images first. What training do you have to do? Well, basically, um, they show you a range of different images and ask you if they've got walrus in them. Uh, or not. Uh, and then plus they give you an option to say whether there are any other animals in the Im image, other species, or whether the images are too poor to say anything. Maybe they've been covered in cloud or um, they're, they're taken in the dark. Uh, and that's what you, you do basically, is sort out the ones that have got walrus in um, from um, each of the others. If you want, you can then also try the walrus counting exercise, which is where you use a tool to pinpoint the walruses in the image and count the, uh, the number of individuals. Or if they're all in a big group piled on top of each other, there's an area tool where you can outline um, the area covered by the walruses. Why is this a useful thing to do for scientists? Well, they've got hundreds of thousands um, of these images, and many of them are poor quality. They may be over land, they might be covered in clouds, uh, or they might be in the open ocean. Uh, and so sorting out the ones without walrus um, saves the scientists a lot of, of time uh, in finding out where the walrus groups actually are. One thing they're investigating, for instance, is whether with the warming of the Arctic, there's less sea ice for the walrus to haul out on. And so more walrus might be um, hauling out on beaches and on um, dry land as a result. So what's your review rating for this project? I think I'd say four out of five stars for this one. Uh, probably less if I was just doing the counting, which I didn't enjoy. Um, the training videos were, or the training images, sorry, were a bit confusing at first because they didn't show you any with walrus in. So it was a bit hard to know what you were looking for. So I would suggest that they change the training slightly and put some walrus images in first and then show you the poorer ones um, later once you know uh, what you're looking for but i love getting the badges i got a gold explorer walrus badge for spotting or sorting 300 images well done ben's dad if any seven dos viewers want to try this project see the links in the description after the video Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these seven days of science. Be sure to check out the link in the description to our collaboration with Plush Foundry so that you can pre-order your very own adorable Swimbo, the Spinosaurus plushie. He's very scientifically accurate as far as we know. Their head would be this round, his butt would be this cute, his feet would be this flat. And he's limited edition, so this is your only chance to get one. Okay, thank you for watching. See you next week. Buy it.